Dear colleagues, dear members of the Blu-ray, I wish you a good morning. Uh, again, my name is uh, Jan Cijek. I am from the research group of uh, membrane separations. Uh, however, today I am going to present you a little bit different topic than a membrane process, but something that could potentially become a membrane process in the near future. Uh, this work is a cooperation between ICPF and Institute of Macromolecular Chemistry, particularly with uh, Dr. Miroslav Otmar. It doesn't work again. Sorry, something's up here. No. What do I do with this? This one? No. Maybe try full screen. Okay. No. Uh, you're not sharing your screen, I think. I should be, no. Okay, I somehow. Okay, now. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, this is the brief outline of the presentation. And but without further ado, let's jump right into it and it doesn't work again. No. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So I will start with something you all probably know and you have probably all taken this pill before. Uh, you take it to relieve pain, inflammation. Uh, and if you take this pill, however, you take 50% uh, of one enantiomer and 50% of the other enantiomer of ibuprofen. It works. However, the issue is that only one of them is the more effective one. The other one, in this case, our, our ibuprofen, is much less effective. And that brings uh, some problems. You may experience problems in your stomach. Uh, and uh, of course, there are some uh, other problems with uh, environmental pollution or of course, uh, the delayed delayed onset of the activity of this of this uh, of this enantiomer. Fortunately, though, nowadays you can buy this drug, which is from the same company that unfortunately doesn't pay me to say this, but uh, <laughs> this one contains only the correct enantiomer, only the S ibuprofen, which is the more effective. And in, when you take this one, you take only half the dosage to get the same effect. Uh, uh, you, of course, avoid the problems that are connected to, to this enantiomer in the regular debugging. So the racemic mixtures, as you probably uh, understood, are mixtures of enantiomers in equimolar, equimolar amounts, and enantiomers are optical isomers. They are uh, spatially different oriented, differently oriented, however, they, their physical chemical properties are the same that when it comes to non-chiral environment. Our body is, however, chiral environment. There's many, many of the chiral recognition sites and therefore uh, the body cares what enantiomer is inside or what, what you take. It is not a big issue with ibuprofen since there's only the delayed onset of activity and some minor problems. However, uh, in the past, there were some very serious cases where uh, administration of racemic mixture led to very serious issues to the ones that, that were taking them or even maybe worse to, to the children. So since, since still there are about 50% of the drugs on the market chiral, we need to really focus on this to prevent this from happening again. Uh, there are several ways how, how enantiomers are separated on, on a large scale. Or industrial scale, there are three of them here mentioned, uh, but still, still this remains uh, quite quite a big challenge. That is more more than less uh, pricey. It is because when you want to separate enantiomers from from each other, as I said, they are only different in their spatial orientation. So when you want to separate them using, let's say, your uh, column uh, in chromatography. Uh, one of the enantiomers needs to fit just perfectly onto the active side, as shown here, while the other one uh, just has to fit less perfectly 
I would say, uh, to, to the active side. So this this looks it is very difficult and it is very difficult and that's why it's still uh, expensive. So the ultimate question, of course, and why we do this science is, can we make it somehow cheaper? Well, in this work, we are trying at least to get a bit closer to that by utilizing uh, non-expensive or inexpensive precursors to prepare new and anti selective material, which in this case is using medifield resin, which is a well-known well -known material. It is for metal polystyrene, basically. And uh, that will be coated with methyl benzyl amine as a chiral selector. I'll explain you more. There's just a brief comparison of the prices. There's price in euros for uh, 100 grams of our precursors, and there are only two of the precursors. And if you compare it to the price of semi preparative, just on the semi preparative column that is commercially available today, you can see that the difference is just, just huge because these columns are really expensive. And that brings me to the experiment finally, uh, where, as I said, we have two, two precursors. We have our Merrifield resin, which is in the form of particles, and uh, that we combine with a metal benzyl amine that is in no solvent, which is great because this is liquid. Uh, at, and at 90 degrees overnight, if we stir it, we, we can obtain uh, this here. Now, this is actually an iron exchanger, an iron exchanger. There's a weak base here that can exchange ions instead of this uh, this hydrogen. We can exchange uh, ions on, on here. And since we have this enantial selective group or uh, chiral, chiral carbon here, uh, this material should be able to exchange the ion and until selectively. Alternatively, we can develop a material like this that will be even more charged, but uh, that is for another presentation. So since we have an ion exchanger, we need uh, acidic analytes because we have positively charged uh, chiral selector and uh, that needs to be packed, of course, with negatively charged analyte. So in some uh, initial screening, we tried two of the uh, unprotected uh, tryptophan derivatives, which means they are only non-amino acid, but acids. And ibuprofen as a uh, as a uh, example of, of uh, acidic drug. And as you can see, the only uh, preference in insorption we observe with this uh, butyloxycarbonyl tryptophan uh, derivative. So further, we went with that. Here you can see the molecule. This is the part of the tryptophan with exposed carboxylic group that will be again negatively charged in certain environment. And there's the protecting group of the uh, tertiary oxycarbonyl. This is our, again, our metal benzyl amine bound to the medical resin. So with that, we took our beads, the ion exchanger, put it into a little glass column and started the experiment. As you can see here, uh, the mobile phase that will elute the, the analyze from the column is composed of methanol, which is necessary. And also what is necessary is acid because we need to exclude the ions of the analyte that will be bound here with some other anions and that is, that is uh, done with acid. So of course, the first question is, does it work? Well, it does sort of. It, it, ideally, we should be able to do baseline separation, which means we should be able to obtain one enantiomer and then the other in 100% enantiomeric excess, which is not what you see here. However, there is still some effect of, of the chiral selector. You can see when S metal benzylamine is paired with, uh, uh, or when, when this one is used, it will prefer preferentially uh, adsorb uh, L tryptophan. Whereas vice versa, if it's if it's R metal benzylamine, it will retain in the column more the D enantiomer. So that's good news. It's not perfect news, but let's go with that. So next, uh, there's uh, a study of uh, the concentration of the acid as a as an element or as a as a, a mobile phase modificator. As you can see just briefly uh, between 100 millimolar and 300 millimolar millimolar uh, acetic acid in methanol. There's no huge difference in the elution rate or in the selectivity. But when we go up up to one molar acid, the elution is faster, but uh, it is at the expense of, of the selectivity, unfortunately. Uh, next, we added some other modifier, and that is, that is buffer. 
uh, buffer is used uh, in these polar ionic modes uh, to promote the ionization of the analyte and the selector, and also uh, to promote the, the elution. And we compared uh, acidic acid here with the respective uh, ammonium salt acetate with uh, formic acid and ammonium formic. As you can see, with the acetic acid, we obtained pretty much uh, the same selectivity as before or, or even better. But what is important is that this one doesn't really work that well with the ammonium uh, formate and uh, formic acid. The, the acid is probably way too strong or the, the modifier is way too strong for, uh, for polyelution. What you can also see here and in the previous one is that there's never zero at, at the and in the 10th fraction. Um, that means that the retention is, is uh, quite high and is higher than we, we would like. And uh, also, you saw that the anatomic excess isn't, isn't really that high. But throughout the experiments, we thought, yeah, maybe we could look at it a bit from, from a bit different angle. And that is to operate it continuously because we have large capacity quite low selectivity, so why, why not try uh, higher, uh, a higher, uh, let's say, throughput to the column, which is briefly what you can see here in 20 fractions. We just dissolve the analyte in the whole amount of the mobile phase and let it run through the column. And surprisingly, the anatomic excess remain quite quite the same, or at least uh, it, it's not like, like the, the direction of the line isn't that, that steep. Uh, there's some explanation which I have probably no time for. So uh, I will skip it to the conclusions where I showed that, yes, it is possible to use this, these two precursors to prepare a kind of anion exchanger. However, the separation wasn't, even though the separation wasn't a baseline separation, uh, there is still uh, some promise in, in the capacity of the, of the anion exchanger to be used further and studied further for potential uh, continuous, uh, let's say, enrichment of enantiomers, and uh, that also means that we could possibly mm -hmm. transform this into a membrane process, which is something we will do in future. It might not sound that intuitive, but we have some ideas about that. I'd like to thank okay. to all contributing and to you for your attention. Okay, so thank you now we have a time for, for questions. Over there. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for your nice talk. Um, at the you mentioned that uh, another possibility would be membrane separation. Uh, would you like to try to compare these two approaches? Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite, I would say it's, in some ways it's similar, but in some ways it's very different because as I said, uh, ideally we would here want to do the baseline separation, which means we get first an antioma and then the second, uh, which is batch process kind of like every chromatography works like that instead of maybe uh, expect, uh, except for SMB. But um, in the membranes, membranes are great because they can be operated uh, continuously, which is something we would aim for in this case. So. Yeah, that, that's like in short, um, the membrane, the membrane usually, uh, or in this case, we think that even though it's very thin compared to the column, right? But since since it can be uh, operated continuously, even though it's, uh, the energy excess would be low, the enrichment would be continuous. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. If not, thank you very much for your the next presentation will be held by Didi Sherba. The presentation deals with the applications of hydrodynamics and cavitation in the
Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Yuri Sherpa, and I came here today to present to you my work in the field of hydrodynamic cavitation and its application in beer brewing process. Cavitation. Cavitation is a phenomenon quite similar to evaporation, just the force which pours liquids to change in gas is not temperature. In this case, it's, it's uh, pressure. Uh, this phenomenon consists of creating the bubble in a restriction. This, is, oh, this restriction, we call it the nozzle. And when the liquid flows through the restriction, and if the flow is high enough, uh, the pressure lowers under the vapor pressure and the liquid starts to evaporate. Then when the restriction ends, the cavitation will end up here and the cavities implode in themselves. And while this implosion, high all mode of pressure and temperature is released in its surroundings and these implosions can affect the leg fit around the cavitation bubbles. Uh, we, character, we characterize cavitation by cavitation number, uh, which is uh, made of uh, pressure out of the nozzle, vapor pressure, density, and the velocity in the restriction. Cavitation number is from zero to one, and zero represents no cavitation, so lower number represents a higher intensity of cavitation. Uh, beer brewing steps. There's like five main steps in the beer brewing. In first, you need to mesh out the malt with the water. Then you uh, you extract saccharides and sugars from barley. Then you add hot and boil it for a while. This is the step we wanted to where we wanted to apply cavitation. You need to extract. Uh, our bitter acids from hops and isomerate them into iso alpha acids to make the beer bitter. Then follows the anaerobic fermentation, packaging, and drinking of the final product. Aim of the work. Uh, as I said, we wanted to apply the cavitation in beer brewing process. We can apply it in meshing to extract saccharides, but the main point we tried was to extract the bitter acids uh, during the hot boiling and isomeric there. And we have found out that cavitation is able to, to higher the yield of the isomeration. Then we try to remove the gluten by the cavitation. And we can also apply it to wastewater treatment to destroy some microbiological organisms. Uh, so, this is a uh, 50 liter brewery, which is located in the Research Institute of Brewing and Malting. On the right side, you can see the brewery. <clears throat> it's pilot plant brewery. On the left side, there is a scheme where it's loop, we, which we use to heat up our work. And we have added second loop. <clears throat> and this loop is consists of the pump, flow meter, pressure meters to to be able to say um, the amount of the cavitation. Here is the cavitation nozzle, this small part, and then there is a valve which allows us to control the cavitation. Here you can see how the cavitation looks like. Mostly visible is, is it in here on black white picture, but it's this small cloud after the restriction. It's very visible also in here. Now about the experiments. So we made parametric study. Uh, it was 10 experiments with different temperatures and cavitation number. Uh, and we observed the isomeration effect or if the cavitation has some effect on isomeration. On the upper part, you've got the equation of isomeration. <clears throat> and on the bottom, bottom right part, you can see uh, how the, how the yield of alpha acids and iso alpha acids has changed during the experiments. You can see that normally uh, iso, iso alphas are rising and alphas 
are lowering during the experiments. That means that the alpha acids are changed into iso alpha acids. Now, on the left side, you can see 3D graph made in Design Expert. There is all done experiments. And according to this result, you can see that temperature have pretty high effect on isomeration and cavitation number have lower effect. Uh, here is this data again, just in different form. And here you can see that there is definitely visible in band between the experiments without cavitation and in experiments with the cavitation. This will lead to the result that we are able to lower the temperature of hot boiling from 100 degrees to 95 degrees. And this will result in lowering the energy consumption during this process. And if you will uh, scale the process up, you will lower the energy uh, consumption even more because we just did it on small pilot scale brewery. Some advantages and disadvantages of the of this temperature lowering. So we definitely get uh, lower energy consumption. That's clearly visible. If you lower the temperature of the wharf, you definitely need to add less heat. But we've got some side effects. For example, higher concentration of dimethyl sulfate. Dimethyl sulfate is compound which tastes like a corn, which is something you definitely don't want to have in beer. But we can get rid of it. We can evaporate it. It's really volatile. So we can just heat the wharf for a short while, like five to 10 minutes, and we will get rid of it. While lowering the temperature, we also get higher concentration of essential hop oils, which came from hop cones. And this makes some flavors and some taste to final product beer. And also, we got the lower TBA in index, which tell us that we put less heat in the wharf, which can be beneficial because the final product will be more stable. And that's definitely a good thing. Then we tried to lower the gluten concentration because we find in some articles that the cavitation is able to destroy gl gluten molecules in some smaller parts or some parts which don't affect celiacs in the end. But as you can see, there is no visible trend in none of these experiments. So this Italian group probably just made it up. <laughs> so the conclusion is that we achieve lowering the temperature of, of boiling so we can lower the energy consumption. Uh, we get know that the cavitation does not remove gluten, so it's probably that end, but someone needed to find it out. And in the future, we would like to repeat the experiments just instead of uh, hop, hop extract, we're gonna use hop cones, and we, we would be probably able to higher the extraction yield from these hop cones. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. It's time for questions. I have a question, if if I can. Uh, of course. <laughs> okay. okay. No problem. No problem. So just a, a question concerning the cost of your process. Did you and I did you have an idea? Of this coast, and uh, if it is, um, if it could be uh, developed in the industry after afterwards. Yeah, uh, we think it's about twenty percent, but we are not not sure because there is many uh, many stuff in the brewery which change, and we are not able to measure it. So, according to our calculation, it's not precise, but we think that it's about twenty percent. Okay. You. Next question. Yeah, so I, it's related to this because you you are kind of claiming or expecting that you could uh, save some energy, some cost by using cavitation, but I did not really understand. So 
uh, you have kind of uh, time uh, for which the cavitation is applied. So does it's it mean that for... you are like uh, it's... circulating? The... Yeah, it's applied for all the boiling. Normal hot boiling in a normal process last one hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So we did we did the same experiment and we upped the cavitation for all the time. And the pump takes about 1.4 kilowatts per hour. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely lower than heating some something, some 50 liters to heat it up to you know 100 degree. So it's it's definitely lower. Mm -hmm. So the consumption of pump is lower than in, than this five degree difference yes. in heating the work. And the, the pump was like used continuously. Yes. So, so the work was like circulating in the habitation. Yes. Part. Okay, thank you. And I have another uh, question. You were mentioning that the, well, anyway, uh, it could be also used for the, the first step, the saccharization. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know exactly the, the terms, but uh, there are used enzymes basically for for cutting the starch into the yeah. maltosis and stuff. So do you have an idea if the cavitation could affect the enzyme activity? Uh, I have no idea. It would happen that it will kill the enzymes, but we need to try it out to see if it works or not. But the basic idea is just that uh, if the bubbles are imploding, they are kind of destroying uh, the seeds by the the endosperm in the seeds. Mm -hmm. So it's lower. It's, it's it's easier to get the saccharides out mm -hmm. the barley. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next question, please. Yeah. What I understood is that you have a recirculation in your fermenter. No, no, it's not fermenter. Uh, it's before fermentation. It's one it's study earlier. Yeah, it's, it's the cooker, right? <laughs> so it's anyway. So wouldn't be very important to consider the ratio flow rate volume of the cooker uh, okay. because probably you have a very thin flow rate and you may not affect the cooking. Uh, our flow rate, large. our flow rate in nozzle is thirteen point eight liters per minute, and the batch is fifty liters. So whole medium goes through the nozzle in like five minutes or something. But it definitely affects the process. And the last question. Uh, I have a question concerning isomeration reactions. So you, can you show the slide? So you have tested the influence of uh, the temperature. And gravitation number. Yeah. Gravitation in a degree. And what about the pH? You measure also the pH, uh, the influence of pH. We didn't measure the influence of pH, what, but we did measure the, the pH during the experiment and it did not change. So it's on the same level in every experiment we have measured. Yeah. You didn't measure in all of them, but okay. in that we measured that it was the same. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. The next presentation will be held by Claudia Vasquez. The presentation will be dealing with calculation of the spira maximum and of the fresh biomass in human nutrition. Just to make sure. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Claudia Vasquez, and this morning I will present to you my doctoral project, which is the cultivation of Lima Spira Maxima and the utilization of its fresh biomass in human nutrition. 
So first of all, uh, the contents of this presentation will include a short introduction, the goals of this project, results, some results, and conclusion. So first of all, what it is Rimasria Maxima, also known as spirulina. Maybe some of you have heard about the spirulina. Uh, it's a filamentous gram-negative and photoautotroph cyanobacterium. It is found naturally in nature, in alkalines or freshwater uh, rivers, ponds, lakes, um, and actually, there are some researchers that even in the Aztec civilization, they were already using the spirulina due to its very rich uh, nutritional profile. Of course, nowadays, we don't do it as the Aztecs. We have a spirulina farming. And this spirulina farming is the production and cultivation of spirulina in artificial environments, such as open systems, open ponds, or uh, photobioreactors in the case of closed systems. And uh, the main purpose is to mass produce a spirulina uh, for the market, to have it commercially available. So, okay, once we have commercially available spirulina, maybe some of you have heard that spirulina has a lot of benefit effects. Um, it has uh, health therapeutic effects. It has a lot of nutrients, vitamins, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory effects. And I am not trying to sell you spirulina right now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe some of you have heard this. And um, in the market, you can find the spirulina in the form of dry biomass and also fresh biomass. But not only the biomass you find, you can also find some of its uh, metabolites, such as ficosanine, beta carotenes, and many others. Uh, I want to draw attention in the ficosanine, which is one of the most valuable metabolites extracted from spirulina. Um, okay, so you might wonder what is the matter? Everything. Sounds perfect, sounds nice. Well, the matter is that uh, most of the spirulina found in the market are in the form of dry spirulina. And when a spirulina goes through a drying process, there are many uh, negative reactions uh, that will lead to the degradation of some compounds, these bioactive and very important compounds. Um, and additionally, I don't know if you have have the opportunity to smell a spirulina, dry spirulina, it has very unpleasant odor and flavor, which is kind of fishy, I don't know, I really don't like it. Um, so this is one of the problems with the dry spirulina, right? So we might say, okay, so let's switch and use fresh spirulina. Unfortunately, some of the fresh spirulina found in the market are packed with preservants, because of course, the main goal is to have extended shell life, uh, and these preservants lower the pH of the whole mixture, and some uh, compounds such as ficocyanin are very sensitive to low uh, pH. So at the end, we will have a product with preservants and low concentration of bioactive compounds. So based on this background, uh, some of the goals we have set for this project are depicted here. However, I will focus only in the very first one. The, the other ones are meant for future. Uh, so first of all, we want to optimize the cultivation of spirulina by enhancing the productivity, efficiency, and sustainability of the cultivation. And here I have the methodology. It is very summarized uh, methodology. So first of all, we will have uh, the cultivation of spirulina in photobioreactors, as the ones you can see in this little picture. And then we will have some different conditions with uh, light, temperature, pH, carbon dioxide, and culture media. And then what we're going to do is to just modify certain of these conditions in order to find the most suitable configuration among these parameters. And how we measure the most suitable configuration in terms of biomass productivity and metabolite yield. Um, and based on these results, what we can um, find is the cost efficiency of the whole bio process. So one more time, what we want to do is to optimize the whole cultivation process. And in other words, what we want to do is to obtain more with less. We don't want to spend much money because this is meant for commercially uh, purposes, right? Uh, so some of the results, uh, I don't have time to show you all the results I have. However, uh, regarding temperature tests, we have found that um, spirulina can grow optim uh, optimally among 30 to 35 degrees. Uh, she doesn't like cold weather as me. Um, <laughs> but however, we can see that in 25 degrees, uh, spirulina is growing pretty well. And uh, actually, when we see the ficosanine content, um, 
we can see that uh, among 25 degrees and 30 degrees, the ficosamine content is quite uh, okay. It's, it's like similar. Of course, it's a little bit less in the 25 degrees, but it's still uh, pretty good, the content of ficosamine in this case. And actually, uh, this is great because we don't really have to use much energy to heat up the whole cultivation process. And this is kind of what we are doing in this big reactor. If some of you have had the chance to see it, we are actually not using any extra source of heat. Uh, the heating is coming from the light source, so we are saving money in this sense. The temperature is among 25 degrees to 26 degrees, and it grows perfectly. Um, some of the results uh, regarding light intensity, we have found that spirulina grows, in this sense, grows better when there is higher light intensity. So 430 and 550 micro einsteins. However, when we see the content of this picosianine, we can see that when it's higher, the light intensity is lowest the content of um, picosianine. So what we can conclude from here is that it doesn't always mean that when we have high biomass productivity, we will always have high metabolite yield. So, which is great because we can use lower light intensity and still have very good content of, of picosianine in the cells. Some other results regarding nitrogen sources, uh, we wanted to try urea as, a, um, as an additional source uh, instead of uh, sodium nitrate, because urea is a little bit uh, cheaper than uh, sodium nitrogen. And we could see that spirulina grows very well in urea. Uh, there are some researchers uh, that suggest that uh, urea can be toxic for the cells at some point, but actually our spirulina is very immune to this toxicity somehow, and it actually uh, grows pretty well in urea. Um, some other experiments will be focused in um, culture media, uh, carbon dioxide, and also pH. One more time, what we want to achieve in this stage of the project is just to optimize the whole bioprocess um, cultivation. Uh, so to conclude this presentation, uh, first of all, the modification of these conditions uh, will aim to enhance the productivity and metabolite yield. Uh, high biomass productivity doesn't always mean that we will have high metabolite yield in the case of ficosianine and the light experiment. And finally, uh, we want to have the most suitable configuration uh, to find, um, to have a very efficient and sustainable uh, cultivation of this microalgae. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you as well to Irena, which is my supervisor. So we have your presentation. Now it's time for questions. First one. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Thank you. And as you mentioned, uh, we ask this is urea. So I suppose there is some literature on it already. So um, would you like to compare what is new in your work uh, compared to the literature? Because you mentioned if you had more light, uh, and uh, if you have a higher temperature, the spirulina grows more, which is <laughs> yeah, thank you for your uh, question. Yeah, actually, all these experiments are based on uh, previous researchers. Um, however, uh, what we found new is that in the case of the nitrogen source, uh, spirulina actually um, in many of the um, in many of the literature you can find that uh, urea at some point will be very toxic for the cells. And what we found new here is that actually this is not the case uh, in our work. Um, the, the growing curve is going down because of nitrogen depletion and nitrogen limitation, but not because of the uh, toxicity of uh, urea in the media. So I can say this is something new. Um, the other results are quite expected. Uh, however, we want to have this as a very first step to continue with the following steps in the project. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question. Basically, what you do is some, I would say, sensitivity study to change the conditions mm -hmm. of temperature, light, or exactly. and uh, you see the effect uh, on the rate of production. Mm -hmm. 
can you then assess how the combined effects of all these influences? Yeah, exactly. That's um, thank you for your question. That's exactly what we wanted to, what we are planning to do, to somehow combine all these uh, different effects on the cultivation, and somehow have like a, a, a complex or like a more um, like a whole view of the whole cultivation process and with the different parameters how it will affect. So we want to combine all these uh, parameters, the results, and we would want to, uh, we would like to have like a, like a whole big result about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Basically, you have to get some model in this process and then go optimize it. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question, please. Oh, yes. Okay, so for us. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. That is uh, on the next slide uh, concerning the, the use of um, CO2, I think so. Uh, on this one? Slide. Yes, this one. Hmm. Um, what is the purpose to use CO2 here and how, in which one will you uh, use your CO2? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, in this case, CO2 we are using because um, microalgae in general, they can use inorganic carbon um, as a carbon source. So uh, we are using CO2 as a like pretty much carbon source for the cultivation um, for the cultivation process. Um, this is great because we can use different sources of CO2. We don't really have to use uh, like the CO2 we have uh, in the lab, but for example, we can have different approaches in the in the sense that uh, we can use CO2 from uh, contaminated environments. So at the end, we can um, clean a little bit the air using uh, like extracting the CO2 and use it for a carbon source for the cultivation of microbiology. And you will use uh, CO2 in, in uh, the gas phase. Um, sorry, can, can you repeat the question? CO2 will be uh, used as a gas, and not, yes. uh, you, you will not use, for example, some supercritical CO2 hours, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, no, the CO2 in this case is used uh, as a gas, just okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. What is the reason for the inhibition of the hallucinogen uh, production with the higher intensity of the bio? Yeah. So uh, why this? Why it is yeah. inhibited? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is a phenomena called uh, photo inhibition. In this case, when the light is very high, there it will cause photo inhibition of the cells. So. Um, one of the strategy of the cells to kind of repel this effect on the cells is to overproduce certain metabolites like uh, lipids, carotenoids, and carbohydrates. So like that, it will the, the biomass will grow more. It will get, it will have like a shading effect. So it will protect the, the biomass, the cells against the light. So that's why we can see that it has like really high um, biomass concentration when there is high light but it doesn't mean that the culture is healthy. It actually means that it's very stressed. So this is because of the photo inhibition. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the last presentation of the expression will be In the name of the presentation, use of total overprotect microorganisms in higher remediation of the system. So, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Petra Mushalkova, and I would like to present to you my research, which investigates the use of photoautotrophic microorganism in use of photoautotrophic microorganism in uh, 
and a bioremediation of surface fracture. Uh, we've been developing a new method of bioremediation of eutrophic surface water, which includes the targeted cultivation of uh, harmless algae or cyanobacteria in the innovative floating photobioreactor. Uh, the organism should uptake the excessive nutrients from the water, uh, especially phosphorus, and make them unavailable from the, for the uh, harmful algae. Uh, the design of the floating bioreactor should enable the exchange uh, of the water between the inner volume and the bulk water. Uh, so this project has two goals. Uh, first, uh, investigate the uptake by non-toxic cyanobacteria, uh, uptake of phosphorus by non-toxic uh, cyanobacteria to lipotric steroids. And then the second goal is to develop a floating bioreactor, which would be quite similar. Okay. So uh, the investigation of, uptake, of phosphorus uptake uh, includes the cultivation experiments and sampling. Uh, cultivations uh, for the cultivation is, uh, are used two types of equipment. First is bubble column and then a model of floating photobioreactor in the beaker. Uh, from samples of the media and biomass, uh, we are obtaining the phosphorus concentrations as well as the dry weight of the biomass. Uh, for the data evaluation, uh, so from the medium and biomass, we have the two, two, two types of data. Uh, we have the concentration of phosphorus in the medium, uh, which we want to seek the reduction under the 0 0.03 milligrams per liter, which is considered as a threshold value for uh, eutrophication. And then from the biomass, uh, we are obtaining the, uh, we can determine the productivity and the uh, concentration of phosphorus uh, intracellular concentration, phosphorus concentration. Uh, from these numbers, uh, I can uh, determine the amount of the phosphorus, which is available in the medium for the algae to uptake, and also the amount of phosphorus in the biomass, which was actually depleted. Now for the results. Uh, first, we tested the effect of different biomass concentration on the rate of uh, phosphorus uptake from the media. Uh, we can see that uh, the higher concentrate biomass concentration, the faster is the phosphorus uptake. So the higher biomass concentration, the faster uh, phosphorus uptake. Uh, then we tested the different uh, pre-cultivations conditions. Oh, it's, uh, it's hidden, but there is a, a phosphorus starvation. So first we uh, we inoculate the biomass in the uh, in the medium with a zero phosphorus for the different uh, time periods. For it was <laughs> so it was cultivated without phosphorus for zero, three, six, and nine days. And from this uh, pre-cultivation, we obtained the biomass with uh, different uh, intracellular phosphorus concentration. So the this is the um, longer uh, the longest starvation. So it has just four uh, four milligrams phosphorus per gram of dry biomass. Then we you know, then we put this uh, obtained biomass to fresh uh, complete medium and uh, again check the phosphorus uptake. So you can see that the more the the most starved biomass has the uh, fastest phosphorus uptake from media. Uh, we tested for the two biomass concentration. Uh, then we want to know the effect of temperature for the rate of phosphorus uptake. Uh, as you can see, the Tolipatrix prefers the higher temperatures. So uh, the fastest, uh, fastest uptake was 30 degrees, then like a little bit slower, 25, 20, then 15, and 11. Uh, for the results of productivity and interest of phosphorus, uh, you can see quite the same. Trend. So we have the highest uh, productivity in the uh, highest temperature, 
but uh, the good result is that even in the in the lower temperature, the cells were still able to store the phosphorus inside of the cell. So still, it could be used in the lower lower temperatures. Uh, then we also tested the different light intensities. Uh, we can say that the lower light intensity has quite similar uh, trend as the lower temperature. So uh, slower growth, slower phosphorus uptake, but uh, still the phosphorus uh, was inside the cells and not uh, like it was the, it has the high concentration of intracellular phosphorus. Uh, with this uh, is a connection also with the change of uh, pigmentation of the biomass. Uh, because uh, all of our experiments are conducted uh, uh, during the continual light, we want to know if the changing between uh, day and night would affect this uh, method. So we conducted the experiments which we set the 12 to 12 hours of daylight cycle. And uh, these are the results. Uh, you can see that the uptake of phosphorus is uh, slower during the night because it's uh, it's connected to the growth and also in the growth in, in the dark uh, there is a slower growth of algae. But uh, the good news is that there is no return of the phosphorus back to media during the night, which was the thing that we wanted to know. Uh, for the developing developing a floating bioreactor, uh, last summer we held a few outside cultivations. Uh, we used this uh, 300 liter tank and a, a bigger model of floating bioreactor, which has in the diameter 30 centimeters. And also we we monitored the uh, phosphorus uptake from the from the media. Uh, Another book, yeah, the first cultivation uh, is was held for the 100 days and the second for the 70, 70 days. Uh, here we changed the mixing because uh, it was quite crucial to uh, to have mixing inside the bioreactor and not just in the in the water in the tank. So to conclude this uh, results, uh, we can say that the Tolipotrix tenuis mm -hmm. is suitable for this bioremediation method. It, it uh, is capable to reduce phosphorus concentration in the water under the 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. And uh, the Tolipotrix is capable to be uh, in the prolonged cultivations. For future plans, uh, we are planning to do the toxicological study on Tolipotrix and the final design of the floating bioreactor mm -hmm. should be developed. Thank you for your attentions, uh, attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. Uh, so uh, you have outside cultivation. Uh, how were you sure that there is uh, no contamination of other algae? Uh, there was and there is good uh, contamination, but uh, this method would be applied for the for the nature conditions. So there will be always some some algae, some some microbes, some contaminants. Mm -hmm. And how did you get the experiment? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, I sampled the uh, the biomass from the in, from the uh, bioreactor. And uh, I counted the in intracellular phosphorus. So there was, <laughs> well, uh, uh, the like, uh, quite part of the phosphorus in the media was uh, really in the telepotric stenosis from the cultivation. Okay. <laughs> Next question. But there were two questions. One that was very similar to what. The this previous question. Uh, I don't know if you have some thoughts of how uh, this reactor is going to work in nature, in the, in, the, in the lake, how are you going to put, how are you going to retrieve the reactor? I mean, more engineering things. Yeah. I think the, the yeah I and the other question is more related to the methodology that you were using. So it seems that you choose your factors, your experimental factors, and, and you 
came up with a full factorial experimental design. But there are a lot of factors. From a methodological point of view, wouldn't it be better to go for a different uh, uh, design of experiments? For instance, box banking or something like this to avoid mm -hmm. doing so many experiments? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, uh, we, uh, well, the toy uh, like, no, wasn't used in this. Uh, in this bioremediation, so we want to start from like from scratch from the zero. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, set the like few experiments, the starting conditions, and this is the this is something that we can maybe continue with for the next experiments. And for the first question, uh, yeah, the the photobioreactor would be uh, uh, it will be made from the some floating device, or it would be. Like placed on some floating device, so I think that the and also the how yeah the brings, size how big could be? Uh, well, it it don't need to be really big. We can have a few uh, few of them on the lake. So I think that we can really like play with the how how many of them there will be and how big they will be. But yeah, it should be the the size should be really uh, uh, useful for the for the. Uh, for the people to use it. So. Thank you. And once more, and the last one mentioned that you have some internal mixing inside your fire. So Again, please. Uh, you have to mix in inside. Yeah. So, how will you make your nuclear or industrial space? Yeah, for, for now, we are thinking about the uh, stir, which would be, uh, which would be, uh, 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 powered by by the by some turbine or the, the by wind, and because we we really don't need to do the mixing, don't need to be continual, but just for like few 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 hours, few few uh periods in in day or at night. Okay, so you. this could be the solution. The last question, please. It is related to know if there is some rubbish in concentration that why the bioreactor reacts will not collapse. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I just would like to ask if there is a range of concentration yeah. that way that the uh, bioreactor will not collapse. Yes. Well, but, uh, uh, I well, um. Uh, like we are uh, in, uh, we we want to uh, reflect the phosphorus concentrations, which are usually in nature. So, which is like one, uh, the eutrophication is like about one milligram per liter of phosphorus. So, uh, we are starting with this, and we are not even considering the higher, like much.